This is CPX number 103, the second precept of the church. This is the Catechism of Pope St. Pius X, CPX, page 131 to 135. This is question and answer number 15 to 26. God give you his peace and nomine patris affidi et spiritu sancti. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler Spirit, Spirit of Truth, who are present everywhere and filling all things, treasure of all good and source of all life, Come dwell in us, cleanse us and save us, you who are all good. Amen. In nomine Patri Sifiti, Spiritu Santi. Amen. And just a quick note, you know, as we finish up the uh, CPX series here, probably before the end of Lent, maybe in the Easter season, right after that we will start the Roman Catechism, which is the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And that is the only catechism that has been defined as infallible in the Catholic Church. I don't think I gypped you in the whole time that we've been doing this uh, CPX because he got 99% of that uh, from the uh, Catechism of the Council of Trent that I'm showing on the screen right now. Uh, it's just he kind of parsed it down to make it a little more digestible. But the next series that we're going to do, RCT, Roman Catechism of Trent, it's going to be more in-depth than CPX and that catechism is longer. But I think you guys will be excited because it's definitely defined, the only catechism defined as infallible for the Catholic Church. So if you look at the screen, I suggest you get that, or the cheaper Kindle version. Now we look at the second precept of the Church. Number 15, what is commanded by the second precept of the Church in the words, to fast on the days prescribed? Answer by the words, to fast on the days prescribed, the second precept of the Church commands us to observe the fast, one, during Lent, two, on certain days of Advent where this is prescribed, three on ember days, and four on certain vigils. Number 16, in what does fasting consist? Answer, fasting consists in taking but one meal a day and in abstaining from prohibited kinds of foods. Number 17, on fast days, may a collation or snack be taken in the evening? Answer, through the concession of the church, a collation may be taken in the evening on fast days. Number 18, what is the good of fasting? Answer, fasting serves to dispose us better to prayer, to do penance for past sins, and to preserve us from sinning again. Number 19, who are bound to fast? Answer, every, every Christian over 21 years of age who is not dispensed or excused for some good reason is bound to fast. Number 20, are those who are not bound to fast exempt from all mortification? Answer, those who are not bound by the obligation of fasting are not exempt from all mortification because all are bound to do penance. Number 21, for what purpose has Lent been instituted? Answer, Lent has been instituted to imitate in some way the rigorous fast of 40 days undergone by Jesus Christ in the desert and to prepare us by penitential exercises to celebrate the feast of Easter devoutly. Number 22, why has the Advent fast been instituted? Answer, the Advent fast has been instituted to prepare us to celebrate devoutly the feast of our Lord's Nativity. Number 23, why has the fast of Ember Days been instituted? Answer, the fast of Ember Days has been instituted, one, to consecrate each of the four seasons of the year by some days of penance, two, to beg of God the preservation of the fruits of the earth, Number three, to thank him for those already given us. Four, and to beseech him to give good priests to the church, the usual days for ordaining priests being the Ember Saturdays. Number 24, why has fasting on vigils been instituted? Answer, fasting on vigils has been instituted to prepare us to celebrate the principal feast devoutly. Number 25, what is forbidden on Fridays and also on Saturdays when not dispensed? Answer, on Fridays, and also on Saturdays where not dispensed, is forbidden to eat meat except in case of necessity. Number 26. Why does the church wish us to abstain from eating meat on these days? Answer. In order that we may do penance each week, and especially on Friday in honor of the Passion, and on Saturdays in memory of the burial of Jesus Christ, and in honor of the Blessed Virgin. Thus are the words of the Holy Pope. So the Pope obviously wrote that catechism you just heard, over 120 years ago, and you may have noticed that the church apparently changed a lot of those rules, 
Most striking is that last part that Catholics were expected to fast every Friday and Saturday of the year for the most part. And yeah, that's what your forefathers did unless you're a convert from another religion. Also, fasting was sprinkled all throughout the four seasons, seasons of the year, even outside Advent and Lent. That's what you just heard him call Ember Days, if you were wondering what those were. Now, there's a free calendar on iCal called 1962 Calendar. You can get that if you have an iPhone. And the neat thing about that calendar is it puts into your iCal not just the feasts of the year, but even the fast days like the Ember Days. So I suggest you get that calendar if you have that iPhone. It's free, and it's called 1962 Calendar. And then finally, we have vigils that we just heard there. Remember, most big feasts in the church were preceded in the calendars of past years. Most of the big feasts in the church were preceded by a day of fasting. And that's why they called the day before a feast a vigil. There's a spiritual side to that, why it's so good to fast on the vigil, the day preceding a fast day. And that is because it's good to make atonement for sins before a big feast day. But there's probably the natural side of that too, namely that, well, feasting isn't too fun if you feast every day. You can make the argument that feasting is only fun if you fasted the day before it. So the vigil and the ember day and the feast day, they're all kind of programmed, not just according to what honors God, but I would even make the argument it really gels with how we are made in our human nature. Now, if you're listening to this podcast in real time, it's obviously Lent, and I want to talk about fasting in the Latin rite versus fasting in the Eastern rites. If you didn't know that the Catholic Church has 24 rites, and that only one of those is the Roman rite, which is also called the Western rite or the Latin rite, and we have 23 rites of the Eastern Catholic rites, like Greek Catholic and Ukrainian Catholic and Russian Catholic, then I suggest you watch my CPX number 33 on the Eastern rites, which I will link in the show notes. So CPX 33 talks about the 23 Eastern rites and the one Western rite of the church. As I mentioned in that podcast, Western Catholics are one of 24 rites only, but we comprise like 98 or 99 percent of the Catholics of the world, where Eastern Catholics comprise a full 23 of the 24 rites of the church, but they only comprise about one or two percent of the Catholics of the world. In any case, the Western rite that most of you are, well, we have really low bars post-Vatican II for fasting, but it is a mortal sin if you don't meet it. Now, the Eastern rites do not attach sin but they have much higher bars as the ideal to, to aim for. Personally, I like the Eastern rites on this, since we in the West have used legalism to parse down our fasting to really at the point that it's just a total joke of just no meat on Fridays, absolutely weak. And most people only keep that in Lent. But you know, it wasn't always this weak in the West. Things got easier not only at Vatican II, but they really started parsing it down. They really started dialing down the expectation even in the decades leading up to Vatican II. The 1917 Code of Canon Law, for example, number 1251 says, The law of fast prescribes that there be only one meal a day, but it does not forbid that a little bit of food, that's what a collation or a snack is, by the way, that we heard in the Catechism, be taken in the morning and the evening, observing nevertheless the approved custom of places concerning the quantity and the quality of the food. Okay, so that's the Code of Canon Law in 1917. What did that mean practically? Well, in a minute, I'm going to read you literally what Catholics in Newark, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey did in the second half of the 19th century, and probably the first half of the 19th century. Before we get to what Western Catholics did 150 years ago, let's talk briefly about the Eastern Rites. The Byzantine Fast of Lent which they call the Great Fast. The Byzantine Fast generally implies one meal a day to be taken either in the evening or after 2.45 p.m. with total abstention from meat, fats, eggs, and dairy products. Instead, they can eat cereals, vegetables, and some other type of food, but it has to avoid fats. Also, smoking is a breach of the fast. They do this for about 56 days. So the Eastern Orthodox and the Eastern Catholics, they basically go 56 days, no meat, a few days less than that, no dairy. But then for that full 40-day Lent, again, they call that the Great Fast, if you can believe this, the ideal for the Eastern Lent is not only no meat, but also no dairy, no fish, no alcohol, and no oils, except a few approved feast days for oil and some other things. 
So what does that leave for them to eat for those 40 days? Well, it's basically fruits, vegetables, carbs, nuts, and peanut butter for 40 days. This is a very intense fast. Um, however, the Eastern churches don't attach sin to breaking this. So if someone invites you over for dinner, a Greek Catholic or an Orthodox, um, Greek Orthodox can apparently break the fast where um, it's an ideal in the East there. Now let's get back to the West. Again, the West equals Roman Rite Church, which is a Western Church, Latin Church. Father Z put on his website a few years ago what the norm was in Newark, New Jersey in 1873 for fasting, signed by the bishop secretary. And this is exactly what most Western Catholics would have done 150 years ago. Probably in Newark, this would have been Irish and Italians. So let's look at this. How did they live the fast 150 years ago in Lent in this country? Father Z quotes directly from diocesan documents, and I'll link his blog in the show notes too. But notice as I read this how much this sounds like the intense Eastern Rite fasts. Again, this is Latin Rite Catholics on the East Coast, 1873, Newark, New Jersey, signed by the bishop's administrator, Father George Duane, on the 6th of February, 1873. It reads, Number one, every day during Lent except Sunday is a day of fast on one meal, which should not be taken before midday with the allowance of a moderate collation or snack in the evening. Number two, the precept of fasting implies also that of abstinence from the use of flesh meat, but by dispensation, the use of meat is allowed in this diocese at every meal on Sunday and at the principal meal on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays of Lent except Holy Thursday. Number three, there is no prohibition to use eggs, butter, or cheese, provided the rules of quantity prescribed by the fast be complied with. Fish is not to be used at the same meal at which meat is allowed. Butter, if necessary, may be used in dressing of fish or vegetables. Number four, all persons over seven years of age are bound to abstain from the use of meat and all over 21 to fast according to the above regulations unless there be a legitimate cause of exemption. The church excuses from the obligations of fasting but not from that of abstinence from flesh meat, except in special cases of sickness or the like, the following classes of persons. First, the infirm. Secondly, those whose duties are of an exhausting or laborious character. Three, women in pregnancy or nursing infants. Fourth, those who are enfeebled by old age. And in case of doubt, in regard to any of the above exemptions, recourse must be had to one's spiritual director or physician. All alike should enter into the spirit of this holy season, which is, in a special manner, a time of prayer and sorrow for sin, of almsgiving and mortification. The faithful are reminded that by a special privilege granted by the Holy See to the faithful of this diocese, a plenary indulgence may be gained on the usual conditions on St. Patrick's Day or any day within the octave. And then Father Z notes that this does not dispense Catholics from the Lenten discipline on St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so as you can hear, it was much more intense 150 years ago. Actually, I do take back one thing I said in comparing this to the Eastern Rite Fast. The Eastern Rite Fast is still harder because dairy and butter is not allowed. Okay, how about now in the West? What's required? Well, as you know, it's pretty weak. According to the 1983 Code of Canon Law, quote, all Fridays throughout the year and the time of Lent are penitential days and times throughout the Universal Church Abstinence from eating meat is to be observed on Fridays throughout the year unless they are solemnities. Abstinence and fast are to be observed on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. All adults who have completed their 14th year are bound by the law of abstinence. All adults from age 18 are bound by the law of fast up to the beginning of their 60th year. The Episcopal Conference can modify these general rules. In the United States, Catholics are obliged to abstain from the eating of meat on Ash Wednesday and all Fridays during the season of Lent. They are also obliged to fast on Ash Wednesday and on Good Friday. Self-imposed observances of fasting on all weekdays of Lent is strongly recommended. Abstinence from flesh meat on all Fridays of the year is especially recommended to individuals and to the Catholic community as a whole, end quote. Okay, so in other words, what it's saying is, except first-class feasts, which are called solemnities on the new calendar, you must abstain every Friday of the year from meat, not just Lent, or you can pick a substitutionary penance according to the 1983 Code of Canon Law on Fridays, but only the Fridays outside of Lent. And so all this gets pretty complex. That's why it's best to go meatless every Friday of the year and to go much more intensely during Lent. 
Maybe you could even consider going closer to that Byzantine fast that we just studied or part or all of what your forefathers did on the East Coast just 150 years ago as I read on the Father Z blog. Please say an hour, Father, for me at Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Pati Sefiti, Spiritu Santi, Descendet Supervos, et Maniat Semper. Amen.